Hi, welcome. Sorry uh, about the confusion. But uh, now I got started. All right. So, um, actually, before I start talking about the text, are there any questions about the course? Or I know some people had trouble finding the syllabus. I hope that's fixed now. Oh, and someone says they have an extra book if someone wants it. Okay, no questions. If you do have questions as I'm talking, you can either just like unmute yourself and ask the question or you can ask in the chat. I'll try to keep my eye on the chat. Um, all right, but so now I'll start talking about the preface. So, um, so this book has a preface and an introduction. Um, And uh, basically, in the introduction, oops, is that out of focus? There we go. So in the introduction, Kant basically talks about what, I mean, this is a rough, idea of the division of labor between the preface and the introduction. In the introduction, Kant basically talks about what the book is going to be about. In the preface, he basically talks about why you would write a book about that, <laughs> right? So, I mean, so uh, first of all, that's, I mean, that's not an unusual division of labor between a preface and an introduction, but it always causes some confusion because um, and it certainly does does in this case, I think, because Kant is telling you why the, um, what he's going to write about in this book is important before he told you what he's going to write about in the book. <laughs> um, um, so, um, So I'm so I'm gonna try to fill in a, just a little bit before we talk about the introduction next time about um, what Kant is gonna do in the book by way of explaining what he says the book is for. <laughs> um, So anyway, like I said, the question here in the preface, the main pre the main question he's asking is, or trying to answer is, what is this book good for? Um, and his answer to that is complicated and he'll, and um, and he'll come back to that question again, uh, kind of in the middle of the book, at the beginning of the section called Phenomena and Noumena, and give maybe an even more complicated answer than he gives here. Um, but um, to summarize at least what he says about this in the preface, this book is supposed to undermine certain, that is the most important uh, purpose of this book as Kant portrays it in the, in the B preface is that it's going to undermine certain metaphysical positions. And those metaphysical positions are bad because they seem to make morality impossible. Um, and when I say he's gonna he's gonna undermine those metaphysical positions, um, I mean uh, not that he's gonna show that they're false, but very roughly he's gonna try to show that we don't so much as understand them that that we're not capable of meaning what seems to be maintained in those positions. 
Um, so, um, so if that's the most important purpose of the book, it seems like, and he, and this is what he spends a certain amount of time in the preface trying to discuss in which sense is, what sense is this true and in what sense it isn't. It seems like the main purpose of the book is negative. The most important outcome of the book is that we can't know the answers to certain questions, right? In other words, again, not that we have the wrong answer. He's, so to make this less abstract, the, the one he talks about the most in the preface, and probably the most important one is about free will. Is there such thing as free will? or not. So, um, um, the answer that according to Kant would serve to undermine morality is that there is no such thing as free will. Not at least in the very strong sense that he thinks that it's needed for morality. There is no such thing. But he's not going to show in this book that that answer is wrong. What he's going to try to show in this book is that we can't we can't know the answer to that question. It's beyond the power of our um, faculties to know the answer to that question. So. Um, so that answer, there is no free will, is neither right nor wrong. It's, uh, again, it's something that, um, in some sense, we don't understand what we're talking about when we say it. And similarly for the other answer, right? That is, if you say, no, there is such a thing as free will, or at least that it's possible, um, we also don't understand that. Um, so as I said, that's right. That's like apparently a negative purpose. The purpose of this book is to, um, as he puts it uh, at some point in the preface, to destroy knowledge. To say uh, that certain things that it seems like we would like to know, certain questions like it seems like we would be good to know the answer to. In fact, he says, it seems like they're the most important questions to know the answer to. In fact, uh, we um, it's impossible for us to know that. Um, okay, so uh, what kind of questions are we talking about? <laughs> uh, first of all, is, are, do you have questions about what I said so far? Okay, I guess not. Um, so, um, so, um, the overall uh, area in which the 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 which the book is focused on the overall type of knowledge that the book is focused on is what Kant in the introduction is going to explain that he calls synthetic a priori knowledge. Now, as far as what synthetic means. I think it would be getting ahead of things to try to explain that now. Most of the introduction is going to be about trying to explain what he means by that qualifier, synthetic. But a priori, um, I think, is worth talking about right away. So um, the way Kant uses uh, the phrase a priori. So right, a priori literally in Latin means like from before. 
knowledge from before. So from before what? Well, so at least the way Kant uses the phrase a priori, it means um, we know something uh, about the object of our knowledge before experiencing it. Right, so a priori knowledge is knowledge that we have before experience. And, oh my, oh no, it's back. Okay. Um, so the overall question of the, of the book is going to be, what kind of knowledge can we have about the objects of our knowledge, that is, about the things we know about, what kind of things can we know about them before we have any experience of them? Um, however, and I think this is this is something that's really important to keep in mind from, from the beginning here. And it's something that Kant doesn't always make it easy to keep in mind because of the way he talks. But that thing about before experience is never going to be meant literally. What do I mean by saying it's not going to be meant literally? There wasn't a time before we experienced anything when, uh, but we already knew some things, right? This would be uh, like um, a certain way of interpreting Plato, again, a like literal way of interpreting Plato when he talks about the theory of recollection, right? That the soul has already seen all the forms before it came into this body, and now it just has to remember them, right? So uh, as Kant himself mentions at some point in this book, it's not clear whether Plato meant that literally either but but in any case like kant doesn't think that there was a time before we started experience anything and in that time we start we we already knew some stuff right so that is we're not talking about literally before experience nor even are we talking about innateness right things that we knew as soon as we were born the before experience part thing here is not really about a time at all. It's not like a really early time, either before all our experience or before most of it or something like that. What it really means before experience is um, that we haven't learned these things from experience. We might not know them because we could, wouldn't even think of them until we've had certain experiences. But, but the basis of our knowledge of, the, uh, of these things is not our experience. So, um, so like the overall question of the book, as Kant will say in the introduction, is how is synthetic a priori knowledge possible? Um, how can we have this a kind of in this synthetic part again i'm not going to try to explain what it means but it basically just means it's like substantive it's it's actual knowledge it's not just like verbal clarification or something like that so can is what kind of how can we have substantive knowledge about things that we haven't learned from experiencing them and um and that overall question uh, is not going to have a purely negative answer, right? So remember, I said, like, what kind of thing is Kant going to say that we have no right to say, we don't understand, we can't give either answer to the question? Um, the, 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 what is the type of knowledge that he's coming to destroy in this book? The answer isn't, uh, synthetic a priori knowledge in general. Rather, he's going to divide synthetic a priori knowledge into two parts, and he's going to say one part is the kind we can have, and he's going to explain how we can have that, which is surprising, right? How can you know something about something before you've experienced it? So he's going to explain um, 
in what cases he thinks we can have that and how. And then he's going to, going to show, based on the answer to that, that is how it is that we can in some cases know this, he's going to explain why in other cases we can't. Um, in those other cases where we can't, going back to what I said to begin with, are going to be the important cases, the ones where he, where um, he, or at least they're going to include the ones where he thinks it's really important that we can't know the answer, because if we thought we could, then we would come out thinking we could know certain things that made morality impossible. Okay, so what's the, maybe I should stop again and ask if there are questions. I know all of this stuff is not 100% clear. And, you know, feel free to ask questions in the chat if you want. Okay, but if not, I'll just keep going. Um, so, so, right, synthetic a priori knowledge, therefore, in the book is going to be divided into two parts. So there's going to be the positive part and the negative part. Although, as I said, Kant already says in the preface, indicates that the negative part is more important. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I mean, you, you don't want to lose sight of the fact that there's a positive part and a negative part. I mean, I say that because I know sometimes, like on the, you know, on the exams, I get back questions answers to questions where people are confused about that and they think that Kant has tried to show that there's no such thing as a priori knowledge but that's certainly not right there's half of this book if roughly speaking is going to be about um how we can have this type of a priori knowledge in what cases we can um and um and he's gonna like demonstrate you know show that, that certain things um, are a priori certain, that we can be certain that they're true and we don't need any experience to learn them from. So, the, but then the other half of the book is gonna be about the cases where we can't do that, even though it seems like we're, we're, we're under, we have a tendency to think we can, but it's an illusion. So what is what is the difference between the positive and the negative types going to be? Well, so in the positive column is going to go first of all according to Kant mathematics. So mathematics for Kant and you know for everyone uh um at at the time he's writing and before uh basically means arithmetic and geometry uh arithmetic including um algebra but um and uh you know like real number arithmetic so it's not exactly the ancient sciences of arithmetic and geometry and similarly geometry isn't just the ancient science of geometry because it's analytic geometry and but um yeah it's it's basically arithmetic and geometry um those are things that Kant says that we know about the objects of experience well okay I, so i should say those are things that we know about something even though we have no experience or even though we haven't learned it from experience of that thing. So like, what's an example of something like this that we know? I mean, one example Kant is gonna give, but, um, but it's a hard one to understand is something like five plus seven equals 12. I mean, well, the hard part is understanding why it's synthetic, which we aren't talking about yet. So maybe at this point, it is pretty easy to understand. Right, you, I mean, 
why would you at least think that you couldn't have learned that that's, that that's true from experience? Well, uh, it seems like we use it to check experience. Right, like if you put five apples into a bag and then you put seven apples into the bag and then you like pour the bag out and you get 13 apples, um, you know that somehow another apple got in there, <laughs> right? I mean, um, that's how you can check, right? If you wanna know like if, if, if somehow, like if there was already an apple in there before you put those in or something like that, how can you check it? You know, pour all the apples out and see if there's exactly 12. If they're exactly 12, then all the apples in the bag were the ones you just put in. But if there's more, then there was already an apple there or someone snuck one in when you didn't see or whatever, right? Um, and uh, um, it at least seems like now, I mean, there are empiricists who disagree with this like John Stuart Mill, who I mentioned last time, who say that, no, if our experience were different, we would decide that five plus seven was 13. Um, and it just seems otherwise because we've experienced so often the laws of addition working the way they do that we can't, you know, we've become unable to imagine it being different. But, you know, I mean, the truth is, it is really hard to imagine it being different. And so you could see why, on the other hand, someone would say, no, that's not based on experience. Like I said, you can use it to check experience. If, ex if, if experience if seems not to match it, you know there's a mistake, been a mistake somewhere, because 5 plus 7 can only be 12. So that's one type of example. And, and a geometrical example that Kant will talk about a lot is that a straight line is the unique shortest path between two points, right? So if you have two points, there's one path between them that's shorter than all the others, and that's a straight line. And um, again, you can see why you might think that that couldn't be something we learned from experience. Because again, you can use it to check experience. Like if you want to know whether the line is really straight, how can you tell? Well, you can tell because it's the shortest path between the two points. Um, and uh, if you want to know whether uh, um, if you want to know whether you're looking at two different things you can tell because if you're looking at two different things, then they're going to be in two different directions. What does it mean that they're in two different directions? Well, it means that a straight line that goes from here to here um, uh, that there's only one straight line going from here and to this point. So if there's another straight line that's not the same as this one, it never can hit this point. Right? So here's the straight line that goes between A and B. Here's another straight line in a different direction. No matter how far you go this line, you'll never get to B. Because again, the straight line is the unique shortest distance between two points. So if that weren't the case, if there could be two straight lines that both went from A to B, then you could look in two different directions and see B in both directions at the same time. 
So again, you know, it looks like we can't learn that from experience because we need to know that to have experience. All right, so those are two kinds of mathematical examples, right? A geometrical and a, um, a arithmetical example and a geometrical example. Um, the other type of example that Kant is going to talk about is metaphysics. But unlike mathematics, metaphysics is going to be split into these two parts. So mathematics is all about things that we can know that we don't learn from experience. Arithmetic and geometry is all about that, according to Kant. And he's going to give an explanation of why that's possible. But what he calls metaphysics is going to be divided into two parts. One is on the side of things we can know, and the other is on the side of things we can't know. So, I mean, uh, Kant is actually going to give a definition of metaphysics. Um, I'm not going to try to define metaphysics now, but um, but metaphysics is about questions like, um, can something happen without a cause? Can there be an event that has no cause? Um, and hold on one second. Could you hand me the, those papers that are in the printing? Um, so, uh, um, right, that's not a question of arithmetic or geometry. Um, it's uh, how is it different from questions of arithmetic or geometry? Well, uh, um, um, Yeah, maybe I shouldn't. Again, I said I wouldn't try to define metaphysics now. Um, just take that as an example. Every event has a cause. So, right, the answer that I just gave, every event must have a cause, is what Kant thinks is the right answer. And again, he thinks that we know that, and that we know that, that we haven't learned it from experience. So I'm going to write that example down here. Every event has a cause. Um, and uh, again, you, why would you, why might you think that this was something that if we know it at all, we can't have learned from experience? Well, if you took 100C, I'm sure you saw like Hume's argument as to why we couldn't learn that principle from experience. Um, and uh, roughly speaking, it's because learning things from experience means learning from uh, certain effects that we see what their causes are like. So like from the effects that things have on us. Um, and what we know, what we start with in experience is the effects that things have had on us. And we want to conclude from that, that there must be certain type of causes. That's what learning from experience involves. But um, uh, for, to be able to learn that way, you already need to know that when things happen to us, something had to have caused it. Right? There must be some reason that I saw what I saw or that I felt what I felt. 
And now we start to try to figure out what it was. That's what learning from experience is like. But you can't learn that way, the principle that there must be some reason that you saw what you saw, that you felt what you felt. You had to already know that, so to speak. Right. And that's, you know, so Hume makes that argument and can, and essentially concludes that we don't know this, <laughs> although we um, have to believe it. Right. As I said last time, that's that that's like the typical place that Hume will leave us saying that, you know, well, there's no good reason to believe X, Y and Z, but you have to. <laughs> you, I mean, you will. <laughs> Right, like as it sometimes says, nature hasn't left it up to such a weak uh, uh, and unreliable faculty as reason um, to make sure that we believe certain really important things. We believe them whether we want to or not. <laughs> um, that's Hume's conclusion, and I think like Hume thinks that's a good conclusion, but Kant thinks that that's a terrible failure on the part of philosophy. Um, um, and so Kant is going to explain how, no, we can know this, even though Hume is right, we, we don't learn it from experience. We know it, so to speak, before experience, meaning uh, we know it, but the basis of our knowledge is not experience. So that's going to be a positive example every event has a cause. That's what Kant calls the second analogy of experience. So we'll get to the proof of that uh, later on. Um, so the positive part of the book is, in the positive part of the book, Kant is gonna show both that we can have this type of knowledge a priori and that we can have this type of knowledge a priori. However, although he shows both of them, he thinks this one is relatively easy. So the part of the book that explains this one is gonna be fairly short. Um, this one he thinks is much harder. So almost half of the book is gonna consist of explaining how we can have um pure a priori metaphysical knowledge and um even giving a system of all the fundamental principles that we can know that way um okay so what's an example of the kind of thing that we can't know well, I already gave one, which I put this way. Is there such thing as free will? Um, another way of looking at that would be that it's actually, um, I mean, you might almost think that this was the same question as is there such thing as free will? Right? Doesn't free will mean, so if every event has a cause, that means that when anything happens, there was something before it in time, which um, given that thing, that event had to happen. Nothing else could have happened. Right? So we see, um, or there is an event B, so an event means there's like a change from one thing to another. Time goes on, there's a change here. And then after this time, there's something else. Um, if every event like this has a cause, it means there's always something before the event be in time, such that if that thing was there, B had to follow. So in particular, suppose the event B is my decision to do something, right? Like I decided to pick up this pen. 
I mean, so what I just showed you, of course, was the event of picking up the pen, not the event of deciding to pick up the pen. I guess the idea of deciding to pick up the event of deciding to pick up the the pen was something that happened in me, so to speak, right? I changed from one state to another. The original state was not knowing whether I would pick it up or not. And the new state was the cat here. Um, and the new state was uh, that I decided to pick it up. So that's an event. It had a cause. That means there was something before that decision, which made it the case that I had to make that decision. So I couldn't have made any other decision. So you again, you might think, oh, this is the same question as, uh, is there such thing as free will? Because if you, I mean, uh, whatever that previous thing was, it seems to show that I don't have free will. Right, that I had to make the decision I made. So, I'm sorry, you're not going to be able to sit on me because I need to use the the whiteboard. Um, however, the way Kant is going to understand the question about free will is um, going to make it into a similar but slightly different question. Um, and so I write out a question, write a question here like this. Um, every being has a cause. What's the difference between every event and every being? Well, an event is something that happens in time. Um, and uh, Kant is going to say that time is a characteristic of our sensible, the sensible world, the world of experience. So when we say that every event has a cause, we mean that um, every change that happens in the world of experience has a cause. But if you say every being has a cause, you mean whether or not it's something that uh, is in time, whether or not it's something sensible, um, it still has, it must have a cause that makes it exactly what it is and not anything else. Um, and Kant says, as long as we don't have an answer to this question, we haven't shown that there's no such thing as free will. All we've shown is that if there is free will, free will consists of a super sensible being, a being that's not in the world of time, um, having effects in time. So there's some there's there's an event that somehow follows from this super sensible being, but the super sensible being itself is not an event. And there's no events in it. It's outside of time. And so as long as we don't have uh, any answer to that, to this question here, Kant says that the answer, that, that this principle here hasn't ruled out free will. It's just shown something about what free will would have to be if there were any. So like, if you, first of all, if you don't understand everything I just said or anything I just said, don't worry because I'm like, all, all of this is preview of things that Kant is gonna talk about a lot more in the book. I mean, you may not understand it then either, but, <laughs> but at least you shouldn't expect to understand everything I'm saying right now. But, um, but what I am trying to get at is the distinction between these two questions and why it's important to Kant that they're different. And, Finally, the, the fact that according to Kant, this belongs to the part of metaphysics that's outside the sphere of our possible knowledge. So we know that 
um, every change we experience in time, we can always find a cause for it, a previous thing that determined it to be that way rather than the other. But if we try to um, go beyond that and ask, well, what about things that couldn't possibly be objects of our experience? Because they're not events that happen in time. And they're, so they're not the kind of thing that we could experience. Do we, do we know about those also that they have to have a cause? And now the answer is going to be, not only do we not know, but it's impossible for us to know. And it's impossible for us to know because in some sense, we don't even understand the question. We don't, in some sense, know what we're talking about when we say beings that are outside the realm of possible experience have a cause. We don't know what cause means in that case. Now, I mean, um, There's a strong form of what I just said, which uh, becomes popular in, in later uh, philosophers under the influence of Kant, but which is not Kant's position, which is that, you know, um, there's certain questions or certain purported questions that are just nonsense. So the, the sense in which we don't understand what we're talking about is that it's as if we just made some noises. Kant is not going to say that. Kant is going to distinguish carefully between one way in which you could understand something, what something means, and another way in which you can understand what it means in order to explain why yeah, we know there's such a question, does every being have a cause, but <laughs> um, but uh, we're <laughs> um, it's kind of people trying to sneak around here with, so as not to get in the picture. Um, <laughs> we uh, we know what this question, it's not just nonsense, this question, but we're we're missing um, what we would need to really connect it to an object, to have it be a question about something. Um, we don't know how to do that in in the case of this of this question, whether every being has a cause, whereas we do know how to do it in the case of this question, does every event of it have a cause? And the difference is, why do, what's the difference between this case where we can do it and this case where we can't? The difference is that the type of metaphysics that we can know is, although we haven't learned it from experience, it's about objects of experience, right? So like I said, an event is something that happens in time in the sensible world. It's the kind of thing we can experience. And the metaphysical principle tells us something about events, right? So it tells us something about the kind of thing we can experience. What makes it a priori and metaphysical is that although it's about things we experience, we haven't learned it from experience. Right, as opposed to, you know, the, uh, Here's an example that Kant is often going to use of a posteriori knowledge, knowledge from after, knowledge that we have learned from experience. Every body is heavy, right? So Kant, which is the universal law of gravitation, every body is heavy. Uh, Kant says, um, you know, we know that because we've experienced that all bodies are heavy. We know that as well as we do, because as far as we've ever experienced, all bodies are heavy, right? We can't say for sure that it's absolutely necessary and without exceptions. Um, but we know it as well as we do because of it, we've experienced the attraction that bodies have to each other. 
Um, so that's something about it that's both about objects of experience. It's about things that we experience, bodies being attracted to each other and whatever, but it's also something we all we learned from experience. We know that bodies are attracted to each other because that's how what we've sensed them doing. But whereas every event has a cause, Kant will say, it's about bodies moving, changing state, the type of thing we experience, but it's not based on experience. We, we know it, um, again, not literally before we experience anything, um, like we weren't around before we experienced anything, but we know it, so to speak, before any experience in the sense that it doesn't rest on experience as its justification. That's the type of thing we can know, whereas what goes in the other column of things we can't know is, <laughs> all right. Uh, you can't really see because of the background, but the, actually not the cat in the background is not the cat. There's another cat that keeps jumping up on my lap. And every time I sit down, she's like, oh, now I can sit on your lap. And then I get up again and she's surprised. Anyway, so the, the type of uh, thing that we can't know is principles that, that claim to talk about things that we could never experience. Right, so in those cases, um, obviously we can't have learned them from experience because they're not even about the things that we experience. So they're things about, like in the case of free will, about the soul regarded as um, an immaterial, atemporal uh, entity, or about God, or the third example, which is in some ways the trickiest, but is very important, Kant says the world as a whole, the world of experience taken as a whole is not something we ever can experience, right? We only ever experience a part of it. So those three things are examples and they're the, the main examples, perhaps the only motivated examples, at least according to Kant, of things that are um, not possible objects of experience. And if we did know anything about them, it would have to be a priori. Do people understand why if we knew something about those things, it would have to be a priori? No, can you explain? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Finally, someone spoke up, right? Be it would have to be a priori because, again, those are things that we can't experience, right? So, like, the soul regarded as, um, I mean, the soul, you know, you could think of the soul as a certain property of the brain, let's say, or of a certain... Uh, um, the object of inner sense, Kant is going to call it something, you know, that we know because we have feelings that, that belong to the soul, and that's what we know about it. But the soul regarded as something outside the world of experience, or God regarded as something that transcends the world of experience, right? Something that doesn't change, doesn't directly affect our senses, um, um, not something we could encounter. That's the type of thing we're talking about. And, um, yes. <clears throat> so is Kant uh, proposing some sort of uh, meta knowledge in this book, like to ground the knowledge, like, like he's trying to constructing the axiom or the like something like the fundamental law that is self-evident so we can use those to derive knowledge well so um Okay, I, I, let, let me let me just finish answering the first question and then I then I'll get back to you. I thought maybe you were asking a follow-up. 
Um, so th the first question was just like, no, I don't understand why if we knew anything about those things, it would have to be a priori. And I'm saying that like, so the alternative to knowing something a priori is knowing it from experience. So like, and as I said, that the, the alternative to a priori is called a posteriori. A posteriori knowledge is knowledge from experience. So a posteriori knowledge is all about possible objects of experience. In fact, it's all about actual objects of experience, right? It's all about things that you have actually experienced. I maybe should have made it a little more clear that experience, uh, although, I mean, I think this is the usual or with, with part of the usual implication of the word, right? That experience means sense experience, right? It's things that affect our senses, either our external senses or our internal sense. Um, and uh, that's how we learn about them. That's a posteriori knowledge. So um, a posteriori knowledge is all about that. And Kant says that mathematics and the good part of metaphysics is also about those same things. It's just things we didn't learn about them from experience. Now, the other type of things is supposed to be things that are not possible objects of experience. We couldn't sense them. We couldn't experience them. So if we know anything about them, we didn't learn it from experience because we don't have any experience of them and we can't have an experience of them. And the alternative to knowing something from experience is knowing it a priori. That's just, again, what a priori means, right? It's something we know about something, but we didn't learn from experience. Is that, I don't know who it was who asked or who, who asked me to clarify that. Did, did that help at all? Or do you still have a question? Yes, <clears throat> it helped. Okay. Did it help enough or do you still have a more question? <laughs> It's it's really just a matter of definition, right? It's like a priori means that you didn't learn it from experience. So if there are things that you know about, but you haven't experienced them, and you couldn't possibly experience them, then then you must know about them a priori by definition. You Right. So if we knew anything about these things that go beyond the realm of experience, we would have to know it a priori. But Kant says that, as a matter of fact, that's exactly the case where we don't have a priori knowledge, where it's impossible. So when we talk when we talk about those things that are outside the realm of experience, in some sense, we don't know what we're talking about because we're talking about things we couldn't possibly know about, not just that we, we don't now know about, but that we couldn't possibly know about. All right, so now let me uh, get back to Lee's question, which was, does, is Kant trying to set up fundamental axioms from which we can get everything else? Well, yes and no. I mean, so, um, so like clearly this positive part of the book, this is what I was going to say next anyway, but now I'll say it in answer to this question. This positive part of the book is directed against empiricists. Right? Remember how I explained the difference between empiricism and rationalism last time. Empiricists think that um, the senses are the sole basis of our knowledge. So um, in Kant's terminology, you could say empiricists think there is no knowledge a priori, or at least there is no synthetic a priori knowledge. Um, again, without getting it yet into what synthetic means. Um, um, so, uh, but but again, synthetic means like it's substantive. It's actually adds to the sum of our knowledge. It's not just clarification of things we already knew. So empiricists think that you know that uh, everything substantive in our knowledge comes from experience. So in the positive part of the book, Kant is showing that um, is 
that is claims to be showing that the empiricists are wrong about that, that there actually are things that we know about um, the objects of experience in advance of any experience. We haven't learned that from experience. So, um, so that's like a rationalist position, right? It's saying we know certain things by uh, um, use of our intellect or reason alone, and it doesn't, it's not based on our senses. Are, does that amount to axioms from which we can prove everything? Well, um, uh, so if Kant said that, um, he would be completely parting with the empiricists and going over to the rationalists. Um, now, like, I mean, it's a little complicated. Rationalists don't actually believe that we have axioms from which we can care, we can deduce everything that's going to happen. Um, there's some like uh, limitations of the on the clarity of human knowledge, basically, that makes that impossible. Like you would have to, to uh, the, the proofs would be infinitely long or something like that, right? Like Leibniz, Leibniz and Spinoza anyway, both say something like that. But nevertheless, they think that in principle, like if you were God, you could from first principles deduce everything that was gonna happen. <laughs> um, so, uh, Kant is going to deny that of the objects of our experience. Um, there aren't any axioms from which everything about them can be derived. You need to actually experience them. There's some things that you can know in advance, but there's other things you can only learn from experience. Um, even if you were God, well, I mean, Remember, God is one of these things that it's going to turn out that we don't know what we're talking about <laughs> when we talk about it. Um, so, uh, um, so like, no, there aren't going to be axioms from which you can deduce all knowledge, but there are going to be axioms from which we can deduce, deduce all a priori knowledge. And that in the metaphysics, so for as far as mathematics goes, Kant leaves it to the mathematicians to go into the detail of what the fundamental principles are and so forth. He just shows that it's possible. But in when he um, in metaphysics, he is, claims to give a complete list <laughs> um, of the fundamental principles of metaphysics. Um, so in that sense, yes, he is going to give axioms, right? And, you know, he says already in the preface, he says, there isn't, I'm not going to give the complete system of the science of metaphysics here, but it wouldn't be a difficult task to develop it based on what I've said. And once it's done, it's finished. Um, he seems very optimistic about that. Like, it's just a little bit more work. Uh, the entire system of metaphysics can be written out. And arguably, he thought that he did do that later in his two books. Uh, well, the metaphysics of morals is about metaphysics. And it, it's about a different branch of metaphysics. I'll talk about that in a second. But the metaphysical foundations of natural science is a book that he wrote later. And I guess he thinks that that does contain the complete system of metaphysics. <laughs> Um, so, uh, um, so as far as that goes, the answer is yes. Now, on the other hand, this part of the book is directed against the rationalists. Because as Kant says in the preface, although uh, knowing that every event in the sensible world must have a cause, and things like that um, is kind of interesting. 
what the rationalists really want to know about is about the soul, God, and the world as a whole. Right, like the subtitle of Descartes' Meditations is uh, in which is the, is proved the existence of God and the immortality of the soul. Um, so uh, that everyone agrees that those are the really important things, and that's where rationalism is supposed to uh, achieve its most important ends. Yes, question, Jeremy? Yeah, I had a, a quick question about um, just, the, so the way you've laid out this positive mm -hmm. and negative uh, mm -hmm. chart, uh, mm -hmm. I was reading in the, I was kind of taking notes in response to the midterm questions just because they're attached to readings. And I, yes. for for this one, there's the, how the, kind of laying out how the book is going to be positive and negative in, in um, it says telling us what we can hope to know about metaphysics in that sense, I'm not sure which sense, and how we can expect to know it. Is that, are these positives and negatives in that, that question the same that you're <laughs> outlining, outlining in the chart or is that a separate? Uh. Like, what do you mean by positive and negative in on the whiteboard here? By positive and negative on the whiteboard, and I think it's the same thing. I mean, I have to look back at that question. I didn't memorize the, <laughs> but, yeah, <I> <laughs> uh, um, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's the same thing I'm talking about in the question. Uh, you know, I, by positive and negative, I just mean, you know, the positive part of the book shows that we can new, know certain things and how we can know them, right? The negative part says, but on the other hand, here's some things that it seems like would be really important to know, but we can't know them. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so, um, um, right. And so I was just saying that although the, the positive part of the book is directed against the empiricists, and um, I mean, it doesn't, again, it's not completely against empiricism. Kant still does think that both of those sources of knowledge, the senses and the intellect are necessary, right? That we can't have any knowledge about anything without both of those sources. So, um, so it's not like, completely against empiricism, but the point of it showing that there is a priori knowledge, that there is knowledge that we didn't get from experience, that point, that positive point is aimed against empiricism, right? Because empiricism consists basically in the claim that there isn't anything like that. Um, but the negative part, which again is really the more important part, is directed against rationalism. And against what the rationalists themselves think is the most important content of math rationalism. And here, Kant is on the side of empiricists like Hume, right? And he's saying, as Hume says, you know, uh, once we ta start talking about stuff like this that's beyond the realm of experience, as Hume puts it, we are got into fairyland, <laughs> right? So, I mean, uh, you know, like Hume uh, doesn't try to give a precise sense to that or draw a precise boundary. I don't think Hume thinks it'd be useful even to have that. But Kant does try to give a very precise sense to that and a very precise boundary, right? He tries to explain exactly why in these cases, although it seems like we have a question that we could answer, we really don't. Um, and uh, this is the part of metaphysics that Kant will call transcendent. Right, so the negative point of the book is gonna be about transcendent metaphysics. The transcendent metaphysics is not a possible human science. 
that we can't know anything about it. Um, So, yeah. a little bit get away from my notes. Okay, so I guess I'll just say so, like. Um, Okay, I'm going to say this part quickly. How can we, how can, how can you show things like this? I mean, maybe this is also kind of what Lee was asking about when he asked, is Kant trying to set up a meta knowledge here? Like, how can you, so on this side, on the one hand, it seems like we're trying to prove first principles. How can that be possible? Or if that's a legitimate demand that I give a proof of my first principles, then doesn't that mean that um, the skeptic who says that I can't know anything has already won, right? Because as soon as I accept the demand that I prove my first principles, um, well, right, you know how the, how the infinite regress is going to get started. Right, I'm going to come up with some pr proof for the first principles, but that's going to be based on some other principles that are even more first principles, right? And then I'm going to be asked for a proof for those and so on and so forth. So that's why it might seem like this project makes no sense. And then on the other hand, how are we going to show this? Um, this point on, on this side, Kant himself is the skeptic. Right? Kant is the one who's claiming that we don't know anything. How is it going to be possible to show that um, without assuming something about these things that we supposedly don't know anything about? Right? Like, how am I going to show about these things that I can't know anything about them without knowing something about them to use as the basis of that proof? Um, So what Kant calls critique, which is supposed to be neither skepticism nor the opposite of skepticism, dogmatism, is supposed to be the answer to both of those questions, I think. Um, and we'll see more about how it works as we go through the book. But the basic idea is that rather than focus on um, the principles we're trying to prove or undermine. It's going to focus on the concepts we need to think those principles. So a concept, if you have a judgment or proposition, like let's say um, all A is our B, or all A is B, Right, like all bodies are heavy, or every event has a cause. Um, right, if you have a judgment or proposition or something like that, um, it contains in it. This is the way Kant and all of Kant's predecessors, at least, think about knowledge um, since Aristotle. Um, it contains in it the 
concepts, which are what it's about, right? So if like my judgment or proposition or pr supposed principle is all bodies are heavy, then uh, I only understand it if I understand the concepts that are in it, namely the concept of a body and the concept of heaviness, gravity, right? Gravitas means heaviness in Latin. So, uh, um, and the, what Kant is going to focus on is the question, how do I get a right to, to use those concepts? How am I able to use them? And the negative part of the answer, the negative part of the book is going to reach its conclusion by, so, by showing that I'm trying to use certain concepts in a case where I have no right to use them, where I don't know how to apply them. So I understand the concept in some sense. I can think it, as Kant says but I don't have a method for applying it. And that's the sense in which I don't know what it means, but I don't know what I'm talking about. That's the negative side. On the positive side, Kant is gonna show that, I'm, that there are certain concepts I must have a right to. That's gonna be the hardest part of the book. The transcendental deduction is the part that's supposed to show that. There's certain concepts that I must have a right to. And then from that, he's going to conclude that certain principles must be true, that because otherwise those concepts wouldn't apply to the objects of experience. So that's the general procedure of the book. Um, and it's the idea is, so, so the idea of critique is basically like, before you start deciding what's true or false, you must first examine the concepts that are involved in your claim and see wh whether you know how to apply them and why, whether you have a right to use them or not. Okay, so that's one thing that I wanted to say before we finish. Um, I had other things that I may not, I will not get to all of, but, um, that, um, the other thing, and this is the most important point of the pref, of the B preface, and it's something that will, um, barely come up in the rest of the book at least the part that we're going to read it comes up a little bit more at the end after the part we read but um but uh and it's you know what that question on the midterm is asking about partly is well okay so um doesn't that mean cut that uh this being the most important part of your book means that your book is basically just like a skeptical book attacking knowledge. And um, um, what's the good of that? So like, I mean, you could imagine Kant would answer that by saying, well, look, but there's also this positive part that shows that we do have knowledge. He doesn't say that. And I think the reason he doesn't say that is that he thinks that Hume is right. We would believe all this stuff, whether we could prove it or not. Right? So like, for example, even if we couldn't show how we know that every event has a cause, and it would, and it was clear that we we couldn't have learned it from experience, and therefore that we have no justification for it. Kant says, um, Kant agrees with Hume that nevertheless we would go ahead and assume that every event has a cause, right? Every time something happens, we ask for the reason for it. Um, nothing, and you know, Hume agrees. No argument Hume can make is is going to ever be strong enough to make us stop doing that. Therefore, the positive part of the book is like on its own um, seems kind of superfluous. It proves things that you would have assumed anyway. So Kant doesn't defend the book that way. 
The negative part, well, so first of all, his he he has two defenses to this accusation that your book is just negative and therefore that it's like doesn't have much value. The first one is he says, well, look, hold on a second. It's not true that negative things have no value, right? That like fencing us off from dangers doesn't have a value. So, you know, he says like, there is definitely a value to setting a boundary to our knowledge and telling us not to go outside it. At a minimum, it prevents us from wasting our time. But it's more than that. It also prevents us from entering into arguments that can never be settled. Which, um, if they stay within the realm of metaphysical specialists, then they're unpleasant enough. But Kant says eventually they'll leak out to the public somehow, and people will start to fight about these things. Um, so it's actually not just to prevent a waste of time, but ultimately to prevent uh, uh, a certain kind of unsettleable conflict in society as a whole, even not um, that it's important to set these to set these limits, right? And he compares it to the role of police. I mean, of course, in our time, the role of police has come to seem problematic in some ways. So maybe this example or analogy could make us feel uneasy. But anyway, he says, um, Right, no one would say that the police have no value just because their function is negative to prevent people from injuring each other. But that's not his whole defense, and that's not the most important part of his defense. And the most important part is the one that I mentioned at the very beginning, that he says that um, this negative project here the real reason it's important is because if we do try to extend our knowledge into this region, we're, it's going to interfere with morality. And that's what I want to try to explain briefly um, in the time I have left. So but I guess I should ask, are there questions about this before I go on? Because I'm going to probably erase most of this stuff. Um, okay, and you know, once again, this is all stuff that, right, this is all a summary of things that are coming in more detail within the book. Um, so what I'm going to say now is important for understanding the context of the book and how it's related to the rest of Kant's thought. Um, but it, like I said, it isn't going to come up that much again within the book. Um, so Kant makes a distinction between theory and practice, or theoretical philosophy and practical philosophy. This distinction is not something that Kant invented. This is Aristotle's terminology. Right, Aristotle also says that there's theoretical philosophy and practical philosophy. Um, and uh, this distinction, you know, is not important only in Aristotle and in Kant, but is I end up discussing it in almost every course. So if you had a course with me before, you've probably heard me talk about this before. But um, um, it's confusing the terminology. It's the right terminology. Like I said, it's Aristotle's terminology, right? These, these are Greek words, theoria and praxis. Um, uh, it's the right terminology, but it's confusing because we now use tend to use those words in a slightly different way. And particularly when we think about a distinction between theory and practice, what we usually mean is something like, uh, a distinction between a not very good theory and a better theory, <laughs> right? So like the example I like to use is, suppose someone said, uh, uh, it would be nice to have a bridge across the Atlantic. 
And I might respond, well, in theory, that would be good, but in practice, it wouldn't work out very well. So what I mean when I say that is that according to a certain theory, it would be nice to have a bridge across the Atlantic, but that theory is not a very good theory. It doesn't take a lot of things into account, like how expensive it would be to build it, how dangerous it would be to drive on, you know, et cetera, right? So like the distinction between theory and practice is like distinction between kind of pie in the sky, disconnected thinking versus thinking that takes all the facts into account. That's the way we tend to use it now, but that's not at all what Kant or Aristotle mean by this distinction. So what, what it is for them is it's basically a distinction between two different types of question you can ask. The question that goes under theory is like, um, What can I know? What is true? Right? These are theoretical questions, questions about knowledge. Um, all the things we've been talking about so far are theoretical questions. Is a straight line the unique shortest distance between two points? You know, does every event have a cause? Are all bodies heavy? Those are theoretical questions. And how can I know them? How, how do I know those things and how can I know them? Those are questions of theoretical philosophy. Whereas a practical question is, what should I do? So it's a completely different type of question. Right, like now, I mean, these two different, these two types of questions are not unrelated to each other. Obviously they're closely related in certain ways, right? Like, so if I'm trying to decide whether I should build a bridge across the Atlantic, there's all kinds of theoretical questions I want answered. How much would it cost, <laughs> you know, et cetera, right? Um, if I'm trying to decide whether I should drink the liquid that's in this glass. Suppose I had a glass, I don't really, but um, I have a bottle. Suppose I try to decide if I should drink the liquid that's in this bottle. Well, uh, I might wanna know what it is. <laughs> that's a theoretical question, right? What is it? Is it water? Is it poison? <laughs> right? But um, nevertheless, the answer, that theoretical question is not the same as the practical question, should I drink it? right? Even though I might need to answer it to answer the practical question. So these are two different types of questions. And practical philosophy is philosophy that's about the answer to the what should I do type questions. That is um, basically ethics and political philosophy. If political philosophy is different from ethics. Because, you know, uh, it's obviously a longer story than this, but uh, to make a long story short, when I want to know what I should do, like, ultimately, it's going to come down to an ethical question. Right? So, like, I can say, you know, well, um, the liquid that's in this bottle turns out to be poison. So... Can't really see the bottle. I hold it in front of me. There we go. The liquids in this bottle turns out to be poison, so um, you shouldn't drink it. And I say, well, why not? Maybe I want to kill myself. So then the question is, like, should you kill yourself? And that's an ethical question, right? Like, are you permitted? Is suicide permissible or something like that? Or it's, or anyway, will lead you to ask an ethical question, right? So practical philosophy is basically ethics. So what Kant says um, in the preface about the purpose of this book is that, um, 
the limitations he's drawing on knowledge are no limitations on theory, right? They're limitations on things we can know when we take the standpoint of uh, um, asking what is true about the world and what is false. Um, Now, suppose that in order for this practical question to make sense, I had to assume, for example, like you might think that for this question to make sense, I have to assume there's such thing as free will. Otherwise, what am I asking there? Right? So the, the question I'm asking is like, uh, Leaving aside all the desires and so forth that I have, what should I do? Um, and that presupposes that no matter how strong the tendency in the other direction is or whatever, I have the ability to choose to do the right thing. Now, um, of course, that doesn't amount to a proof that there's such thing as free will. After all, it's a theoretical question whether there's such a thing as free will. Um, so, uh, so now suppose I'm trying to decide whether such a thing as ethics is possible. And suppose I've determined that for ethics to be possible, I have to assume that there's such thing as free will. Now it seems like, like it's parallel to the bridge case, let's say, right? Like, let's say I've determined that um, uh, if the answer to the question, should we build a bridge across the Atlantic is true, uh, it must be that it costs less than a you know a certain amount. So now I have to like investigate the theoretical question before I can go back to the practical question. So you might think similarly here, like okay, I found out that this question doesn't have an answer unless I presuppose that we have free will. It's actually it's not really parallel to the bridge case, is it? It's worse, <laughs> right? In the bridge case, it's like the worst that can happen is the answer will be no. But here, the worst that can happen is it will turn out I, I don't have a right to ask this question. There is no question because what I'm going to do is already determined. So, like, so you might think, all right, before I do any ethics, I should go back and settle the theoretical question is there such a thing as free will? And Kant says that if we did that, um, and I think he's basing himself on what happened in the case of Spinoza, but also Leibniz, really. He didn't say that if we did that, um, we would um, tend to come out with the answer, there is no such thing as free will, it's impossible. So then we would go back to practical philosophy and say, sorry, I know you needed to presuppose this for there to be such a thing as ethics, but unfortunately it's false. So there is no such thing as ethics. So like, suppose you think that's a bad outcome, like, infinitely bad, like nothing could be worse than showing that there's no such thing as ethics. <laughs> then you might be very happy to learn that actually that theoretical question that we went back for the answer to is a question we don't even understand from a theoretical standpoint. We can't say yes or no to it. So theoretical philosophy says, 
I'm sorry, I can't, I can't say anything about that. And now you go back to ethics and you say, um, the answer is from theoretical philosophy is it can't say anything about that. And now ethics says, well, I know what to say about it um, because um, I'm gonna tell you what your duty is and it won't make any sense unless you have free will. So you're ethically obliged to presuppose that there's such a thing as free will. And that that's basically the way Kant thinks it comes out. So he he just he describes that by saying he had to destroy knowledge to make room for faith. By by faith, he means there things that you're rationally required to presuppose, but not based on theoretical axioms, but based on um, what your ethical obligations are. If theoretical philosophy could extend out into this region and say there is no such thing as free will, then that would settle the question because it, you know, it is a theoretical question. And if theoretical philosophy could answer it, we would be stuck with the answer. But once theoretical philosophy has been limited into its own region, it leaves this one empty for ethics to presuppose what it must in it. Um, and that's what Kant thinks the positive payoff of the book is, the, the important one, the one that we wouldn't have otherwise known. Um, the book shows that ethics is possible by showing that theoretical philosophy is um, forever prevented from interfering with it. Um, and as I said, at least from Kant's point of view, that's in some sense the most important possible thing to show that ethics is possible. Right, nothing could be more important than that. Um, because nothing could be more relevant to the question, what should I do? All right, um, see I'm out of time. Uh, um, so uh, I will see you all, I hope tomorrow in person. Um, okay. See you then. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.